for having contributed to the warm atmosphere uh, that she had offered for us. This morning, uh, we have a very important address by the State Councillor and Defence Minister of the People's Republic of China, uh, Wei Feng He. The IISS delegation to the Shangri-La Dialogue, comprised of me, James Crabtree, Maya Nowens, and Lynn Quark, not our whole delegation, but some who have a special interest in the People's Republic of China and its strategy in the Asia-Pacific, had a one-hour bilateral with General Wei Feng He, during which we agreed to strengthen intellectual exchanges and cooperation between uh, the People's Republic of China and the senior analysts at the Double Die Double S. So I was very grateful uh, for that offer. General Wei Feng He attended his first Shangri-La Dialogue as State Council and Defence Minister in 2019, wrote confirming his desire to attend in 2020, and of course we know that owing to uh, the COVID pandemic, we were unable to convene uh, those two years. But here he is in 2022 uh, at his second IISS uh, Shangri-La Dialogue, uh, addressing us in the fifth plenary session on the morning of the concluding day, and he will now deliver his address on China's vision for regional order. General Wei Feng He, the podium is yours. Thank you, sir. It's a good pleasure to come back to the Shangri-La Dialogue after three years. First, I want to thank Dr. Chipman and the WIWS for the invitation. My thanks also go to the Singaporean government, the Ministry of Defense, and Minister Ngeng Han for your hospitality. My colleagues, I believe we come here today for shared purpose. We are here for friendship, cooperation, and we are here for regional peace and stability. Now, I will share with you China's vision for regional order. Number one, our world is facing multiple crises, really seen in history. And the way forward is to uphold and practice multilateralism and build a community of shared future for all. Today, we are witnessing historic and unprecedented changes. In addition to the geopolitical shift and the once-in-a-century pandemic, the Ukraine crisis has further changed international strategic landscape. There are more crises and chaos, and our world is neither peaceful nor tranquil. However, China believes that peace and development should always be the shared goal of humanity whether to win the final victory over COVID and achieve economic recovery, or to stop war and safeguard peace, equity, and justice. We in all countries should reach out to each other and work together to tide over the current difficulties. As an ancient Chinese philosopher said, maintaining the right conduct and upholding justice should be the way to follow across the world. Yesterday, Secretary Austin addressed the first plenary session. I disagree with some points he made and 
firmly reject the U.S. smearing accusation, even threats against China. China believes, first, we should strengthen solidarity and coordination and oppose confrontation and division. COVID-19 is still raging across the world, with new variants increasing and spreading much faster, taking a great human toll. How the pandemic evolves is uncertain. Meanwhile, the impact of the Ukraine crisis is exacerbating. No one can stay unaffected by these major crises. We are all in the same boat, and we cannot overcome them unless we work together. We must、uh, say no to exclusive blocks, confrontation, containment, decoupling, and supply disruption. Building a high wall around one's turf and forming parallel systems can only split the world and undermine the shared interests of all countries. From the two world wars to years of east-west confrontation in the Cold War, to local wars, terrorism, and regional turbulence since the start of the 21st century, these disasters have all inflicted huge sufferings on humanity. All this tells us that confrontation and division will get us nowhere, but only solidarity and cooperation can keep us on the right path. Second, we should uphold fairness and justice and oppose hegemony. Countries, big or small, strong or weak, rich or poor, are all equal. We should respect each other and treat each other as equals, and reject a zero-sum game in which the winner takes all. We should seek peaceful coexistence and win-win cooperation, rather than hegemony and power politics. Politics. Global affairs should be handled through consultation by all stakeholders, instead of being dictated by just one country or small group of countries. No one, and no country, should impose its will on others or bully others under the guise of multilateralism. We noted Secretary Austin's remarks on the U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy. To us, the strategy is an attempt to build an exclusive small group in the name of a free and open Indo-Pacific, to hijack countries in our region, and target one specific country. It is a strategy to create conflict and confrontation to contain and encircle others. China holds that for any strategy to be viable, it should adapt to the historic and global trends and contribute to regional peace, stability, and the shared interests of all. Third, we should uphold the rule of law and oppose acting on one's own. The order of, of human civilization must be based on the rule of law. Otherwise, the law of jungle will prevail. We must observe basic norms governing international relations, enshrined in the purposes and principles of the UN Charter. We should uphold sovereign equality of all nations and say no to bullying and might makes right. We should seek peaceful settlement of disputes and reject. The use of or threat to use force. We should not interfere in others' internal affairs and say no to unilateral sanctions and long-arm jurisdiction. One is not in a position to champion any international law, rule, or order if it only follows rules that fit its interests, minds others' family business with its own domestic rules, or binds or even attacks others with a convention it has not acceded to itself. Fourth. We should promote exchanges and mutual learning, and oppose the practice of closing the door and excluding others. As the Chinese saying goes, all living things should grow without harming one another, and all roads should connect rather than block each other. 
Countries may differ in history, culture, ethnicity, religion, and development models, but should not be categorized as superior or inferior. We can surely draw on each other's strength. Only the one who wears the shoes knows if they fit or not. The right path for a country must fit its realities and be conducive to its development. The obsession with arrogance, biases. And so-called value-based alliances only turns away from common values of democracy and freedom. True freedom and openness is never something one enjoys at the expense of freedom and openness of others. If I am open to you and you are not open to me, that's not true open. When you lead a good life, you should. Not prevent others from leading the same good life. The world will only be a better place when everyone leads the same good life, and this is the right way forward. Number two, the world today is in a new period of volatility and transformation. The Chinese government and the military will add more positive momentum to the changing world. China believes in harmony among all nations and universal peace. In everything we do, we strive to promote people's well-being, national rejuvenation, and world peace. Great mountains will stand strong against the raging torrents in this challenging time. As a responsible major country, China will continue. To contribute its share to building world peace, promoting global development, safeguarding international order, and providing public goods. First, China has both achieved a strategic outcome in its COVID-19 response, and made a great contribution to the global fight against the pandemic. Under the leadership of the Communist Party of China, the Chinese people fought a tenacious battle against COVID-19 with great solidarity. The Chinese government puts its people and their lives first, endeavors to prevent both imported cases and domestic resurgences, and follows a dynamic zero COVID policy. Today, China is one of the safest countries in the world, with the lowest COVID-19 induced. Death rate, and China is also a global leader that has contributed to world economic recovery. For a country with 1.4 billion people, such as ours, it is no easy job to bring the pandemic under effective control. China's success in COVID response is. In itself, a major contribution to the global fight, and a miracle in the human history of pandemic alleviation. China has also been actively involved in international cooperation on fighting COVID. We have provided assistance to around 170 countries and international organizations, and delivered more than 2.2 billion doses of vaccines to over 120 of them. The Chinese military has cooperated with and provided vaccines to the militaries of many countries. As a responsible major country, China will continue to enhance international cooperation and work with other countries to defeat the pandemic. Second, China's development is not a threat to others. On the contrary. It is a big contribution to global peace and development. China will continue to develop. Over the past century, the Chinese people has traveled a long and glorious journey, and created a miracle of spectacular development. Last year. We in China celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Communist Party of China, and we realized the first centenary goal of building a moderately prosperous society in all respects. We have made 
historical achievements in eliminating absolute poverty in China, and lifted nearly 99 million rural population out of poverty. This is a rare achievement in the human history of poverty alleviation. Last year, China's GDP grew by 8.1 percent, and its per capita GDP surpassed 12,000 U.S. dollars. Earlier this year, overcoming difficulties caused by the pandemic, China hosted the Beijing Winter Olympics and the Paralympics that are streamlined, safe, and splendid. Today, China and the rest of the world are closely interconnected. China has,、uh, for years, contributed around 30 percent of global economic growth. It is now the largest trading partner of more than 120 countries and areas. China's Belt and Road Initiative. Is one of the world's broadest-based and largest platform for international cooperation. China's development is a historical trend, and it is neither possible nor sensible to try to stop it. China is rock solid in its commitment to pursuing peaceful development. This is a national policy. Solemnly written in both the Constitution of the Communist Party of China and the Constitution of the People's Republic of China, China has delivered its achievement not by restoring to colonialism, exploitation, and plundering others. Rather, it owes its development to the hard work and great sacrifice of its people. China's growth. Is not a charity given by others. China's、uh, peaceful development has brought the world with opportunities, economic development, and better living standards. China is on an irreversible course to realize national rejuvenation, and we will surely contribute more to world peace and development. China is committed. To building a new type of international relations, based on mutual respect, fairness, and justice, and win-win cooperation, China will continue to grow friendly and cooperative relations with all countries and provide new opportunities to the world with its new development. We will jointly promote the Global Development Initiative with all parties to achieve security, growth, and prosperity for all. Third, the Chinese military is a force for peace, and will remain firm in safeguarding China's sovereignty, security, and development interests. In modern times, the Chinese people suffered so much from foreign aggression and wars. Having gone through the hard times, we in China perhaps know better. How valuable peace is. That is why China pursues a defense policy that is defensive in nature. The philosophy of peace, amity, and harmony is rooted in China's 5,000-year history, and it is the binding pursuit of the Chinese nation. Upholding peace and harmony, promoting cooperation and common development, and pursuing universal love and non-aggression are values that underpin the Chinese civilization. Since the founding of the PRC, we have never proactively started a war against others or occupied one inch of others' land. No matter what stage of development it reaches, China will never seek hegemony. Or engage in military expansion or arms race. China is committed to upholding world peace and stability and forging new security partnership based on equality, mutual trust, and win-win cooperation. China has military ties with over 150 countries. It has sent nearly 50. Thousand fifty thousand peacekeepers to UN peacekeeping missions, 
more than the total sent by the other permanent members of the UN Security Council. China has sent over 120 naval vessels on maritime escort missions and provided protection for more than 7,000 Chinese and foreign ships. As the Chinese military grows, it will add to the growth of the global force for peace. This year marks the 95th anniversary of the founding of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. Born in wars, the POA has fought many powerful adversaries and won many victories. We do not provoke troubles, but we will not flinch in the face of provocation. We do not bully others but we will not allow others to bully us. Our doctrine is that we will not attack unless we are attacked, and we will surely counterattack. Counterattack if we are attacked. If anyone dares to attack us, the POA will not hesitate to fight back and defeat the aggressor. Yatashanchu 亚太命运共同体，实现亚太地区的持久和平和普遍安。Enjoy，一直没看。Durable peace and provide security for all. To realize this vision, we need to appreciate the fact that we are all in the same world and have a shared future, and we should abide by the principle of mutual respect equality, harmony, and win-win cooperation. In his recent address made at the Boa Forum for Asia, President Xi Jinping proposed the Global Security Initiative. He elaborated on China's stand on promoting security for all and upholding global peace and stability, and called for promoting common, comprehensive, cooperative, and sustainable security. President Xi pointed a new direction of removing the root cause of international conflicts and achieving enduring global peace and order. Both the history and reality have told us that practicing hegemony, hegemony and power politics forming confrontational blocks or pursuing one's own security at the cost of others will only create new confrontation and risks. Countries in the region should accommodate the core interests and major concerns of each other. China fully appreciates and respects the legitimate concerns of other countries. Likewise, we expect our core and legitimate interests to be respected. I will now state China's position on the following issues. First on Taiwan. Taiwan is first and foremost China's Taiwan. It's an internal affair of China's. I have three points to make here. First, China will definitely realize its reunification. China's reunification is a great cause of the Chinese nation, and it is a historical trend that no one and no force can stop. Peaceful reunification is the greatest, greatest wish of the Chinese people. We have the utmost sincerity and are willing to make greatest efforts to achieve that. And we are still making every effort with the greatest sincerity to deliver peaceful reunification. The Taiwan question arose out of the weakness and chaos of the Chinese nation. It is a legacy of China's civil war, 
and will surely be resolved as the Chinese nation achieves its rejuvenation. Second, those who pursue Taiwan independence in an attempt to split China will definitely come to no good end. The Democratic Progressive Party authorities are attempting to change the status quo that both the mainland and Taiwan belong to one China. They refuse to recognize the 1992 consensus and are pursuing incremental Taiwan independence as a pawn of anti-China foreign groups. They will only be used and then abandoned by their masters. The United States fought a civil war for its unity. Though China never wants such a civil war, we will resolutely crash any attempt to pursue Taiwan independence. Let me make this clear. If anyone dares to secede Taiwan from China, we will not hesitate to fight. We will fight at all costs, and we will fight to the very end. This is the only choice for China. Third, foreign interference is doomed to failure. Some country has violated its promise on the One China principle as it applies to Taiwan. It has connived at and supported the moves of separatist forces for Taiwan independence. It keeps playing the Taiwan card against China, and it often cites the so-called Taiwan Relations Act using its domestic law to interfere in the internal affairs of another country. China is firmly opposed to such acts. Here, I want to make it clear to those seeking Taiwan independence and those behind them, the pursuit of Taiwan independence is a dead end. And stop the delusion. And soliciting foreign, stops, foreign support will never work. And they should never think about it. The wheels of history roll on, and no one can stop China's path towards reunification. No one should ever underestimate the resolve and the capabilities of the China's armed forces to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity. Second, on the South China Sea, China calls for turning the South China Sea into a sea of peace, friendship, and cooperation. This is a shared wish and responsibility of countries in the region. Here, I think we need to answer three questions. First, who should we rely on to protect peace in the South China Sea? Thanks to the joint efforts of China and ASEAN countries, we have seen greater stability in the area. China respects freedom of navigation enjoyed by all countries under international law. Actually, freedom of navigation is not under threat in the South China Sea. China is one of the biggest beneficiaries of freedom of navigation in this area. If it were hampered in the South China Sea, China would suffer the most because without freedom of navigation, China's economy would hardly grow. However, some big power has long practiced navigation hegemony on the pretext of freedom of navigation. It has flexed muscles by sending warships and warplanes on a rampage in the South China Sea. As neighbors that cannot be moved away from each other, we countries in this region must stay vigilant and prevent some countries outside this region from meddling in the affairs of our region and turning the South China Sea into troubled waters. Second, how do we build friendship in the South China Sea? China and ASEAN countries are connected by geography and culture. Last year, the two sides established comprehensive strategic partnership, marking a new milestone in the history of China-ASEAN relations. As long as China and ASEAN countries continue to strengthen mutual trust and build consensus, no one will be able to break our solidarity. Those who try to sow discords among us, stir up confrontation, and force others to take sides will only end up in failure. Third. 
how to, how do we promote cooperation in the South China Sea? China calls for settling maritime disputes through friendly consultation. Neighbors sometimes may not agree with each other on every issue, and this is natural. The key lies in upholding our shared, bigger interests while solving and resolving small differences, properly handling the disputes, and working together to promote cooperation and common development. We should proceed from our overall and long-term interests, seek full and effective implementation of the DOC, and make steady progress in the consultation of the COC. We should accommodate the interests of all parties and deepen and expand tangible cooperation. And we should make joint efforts to better protect and develop the South China Sea. Third, on China-U.S. relations, the China-U.S. relationship is at a critical and crucial juncture. China believes that a stable China-U.S. relationship serves the interests of both countries and the rest of the world. China and the U.S. are two important major countries, and China-U.S. cooperation is vital for global peace and development. Confrontation will benefit neither our two countries nor other countries. China opposes using competition to define the bilateral relations. It will be a historic and strategic mistake to insist on taking China as a threat and a, an adversary or even an enemy. We require the U.S. side to stop smearing and containing China. Stop interfering in China's internal affairs and stop harming China's interests. The bilateral relationship cannot improve unless the U.S. side can do that. Both sides should implement the important consensus reached by the two heads of state. At the request of President Biden, President Xi had a video conference and a phone call with him in November last year and March this year. The two leaders agreed that China and the U.S. should respect each other, live in peace, and avoid confrontation. However, some people in the U.S. still try to suppress and contain China on all fronts. China's position is very clear. If you want to talk, we should talk with mutual respect. If you want to engage, we should seek peaceful coexistence. If you want to cooperate, we should promote mutual benefits and win-win results. However, if you want confrontation, we will fight to the end. The two militaries should make positive efforts for a stable bilateral relationship. An old Chinese saying goes, since ancient times, great commanders are never belligerent. If someone forces a war on China, the POA will not flinch. The Chinese and U.S. militaries should enhance strategic trust, avoid misunderstanding and miscalculation, manage risks and crises, and prevent frictions and conflicts. China hopes to have a sound, steady, and a growing relationship with the United States. Nevertheless, we will also be firm in safeguarding our national interests and dignity. Fourth, on the Ukraine crisis. It is the top focus of the international community and has exerted major impact on the international strategic environment. China deeply regrets and is greatly saddened by current developments in Ukraine. I think the historical context behind Ukraine is clear. What is the root cause of this crisis? Who is the mastermind behind it? Who loses the most? And who stands to gain the most? Who is promoting peace? And who 
is adding fuel to the fire. I think we all know the answers to these questions, and I think relevant countries need to reflect on the roles they have played. China's position is fair and objective. China holds that it is important to observe the purposes and principles of the UN Charter, respect sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries, and respect and accommodate the legitimate security concerns of all parties. Conflict or war is the last thing China wants to see. Meanwhile, we do not believe that maximum pressure or sanctions can solve the problem. If anything, they may even exacerbate tensions and further complicate the issues. China is committed to promoting peace talks. On the second day of the conflict, President Xi. Had a call with President Putin. Later, and and President Xi mentioned in the phone call that we need to have peace talks. Later, President Xi had phone calls with President Biden and other world leaders to push for peace negotiations. As an old Chinese saying goes, "He who ties the bear to the tiger." Should untie it. China supports talks between Russia and Ukraine. We also hope the U.S. and NATO will have talks with Russia to create conditions for an early ceasefire. As a responsible major country, China will continue to play a constructive role and contribute our share to easing tension. And realizing a political resolution of the crisis, this year the Communist Party of China will convene its 20th National Congress. We will continue to advance our course on all fronts. There is so much in common between the Chinese dream and the dreams of people of other countries. The Chinese military will work hand in hand with militaries of other countries to deepen security cooperation, build a community with a shared future for mankind, and make new and greater contributions to both global peace and peace in the Asia Pacific. And with that, I conclude my speech. Thank you. Thank you,、uh, General Wei, for conveying the principles that officially guide、uh, China's global strategy, and providing also a few thoughts on Taiwan, the South China Sea, and U.S.-China、uh, relations. I'm sure、uh, some of your general comments on uh, Chinese uh, principles uh, that guide、uh, China's global strategy. Uh, will also、uh, guide some of the questions here on how those principles are applied in practice.、Uh, I think what I'll do is I'll take uh, five uh, questions or so from the floor and come back to General Wei for his uh, uh, comments. Uh, we have just over 20 minutes, so I'd invite both the questions、uh, and the responses to be crisp. My、uh, first person on the list um, is uh, from. Uh, France. Here she is, Valerie Nique. Thank you,、uh, General Wei. You just said that China will not hesitate to use force to crush Taiwan independence. Can we conclude that if Taiwan does not formally declare independence, China will respect the status quo、uh, for how long it、uh, takes to uh, reunify uh, without trying to reunify by force? Thank you. And from Australia, Emma Connors.、Oh, hello, I'm Emma Connors, journalist from the Australian Financial Review. Thank you very much for your speech. Last week, the Ministry of Defence said Australia faced serious consequences if it did not stop its military forces from taking provocative action in the South China Sea. What would those serious consequences be? Thank you. And from the Netherlands and the WIWS. Mayor Owens. 
Thank you, John. Um, General Wei, in October 2020, your government unveiled a new military modernization benchmark to be achieved by 2027. Um, and there's been some disagreement as to whether this entails an accelerated goal to modernization. Can you please give greater clarity as to, whether, uh, as to what this goal entails? Thank you. And from Japan, Hirokuya Akita. Thank you very much. My question about the China and Russia's military cooperation. President Xi and President Putin signed a joint statement on February 4th and said that there wouldn't be, a, no, there wouldn't be any limitation for both countries' cooperation. So in this context, how China is supporting so-called Russian military operation in Ukraine? Or if it is not, will China provide some material support to the Russian military? Uh, thank you. Thank you. And from the U.S., Alistair Gale. Thank you. Um, General, the U.S. says China is on an unprecedented buildup of its nuclear weapons program. And one piece of evidence for this is around 300 alleged missile silos in western China near Yumen, Hami, and Ordos that, be, that can be clearly seen from the satellite images. You are a former commander of the PLL rocket force. Can you confirm what these structures are, if they are missile silos, and whether you intend to use them to deploy ICBMs? Thank you. Thank you. I think that's five. So, General Wei, your responses. Huh? It's great to be back here and have the opportunity to take questions from scholars. There are five questions. Let me give very brief answers in the interest of time, since we only have 20 minutes left. First on Taiwan. Taiwan is China's Taiwan. It is a province of China. China, as we speak, is working with utmost efforts and sincerity for reunification in a peaceful way. In the case of secession, China reserves other options. You asked about Taiwan. I have sent my message and made my points clear in my remarks. Someone is playing Taiwan as a card. But the DPP authorities refused to recognize the 1992 consensus leading to escalation of complexities. Therefore, on the basis of making the utmost efforts for peaceful reunification, China reserves other options. On South China Sea, I've also touched upon it in my, omitting, you know, in my remarks. China's position on the South China Sea is consistent. We're committed to building the South China Sea a sea of friendship and cooperation. We will make positive efforts to that end. China believes on South China Sea issues, we must jointly better utilize and develop the South China Sea to promote greater peace. The South China Sea issue should be resolved by countries in the region. The question is, right now there are countries, non-regional countries, meddling with issues in the South China Sea, stirring up trouble. 
So China's position is we would like to work with regional countries to jointly uphold peace in the South China Sea, properly manage differences and risks. On nuclear capabilities, many people are interested in the development of China's nuclear capabilities since last year. I have worked for decades in this regard, so I think I'm quite qualified to answer this question. Since the building of China's nuclear force, China has developed its capabilities for over five decades. It's fair to say there has been impressive progress. That is the fact. You asked for the purpose and development of China's nuclear capabilities. Maybe you want to hear some confidential information from me. And let me be frank that China's policy on nuclear power is consistent. We use it for self-defense. We will not first be the first to use nuclear power. And we develop nuclear capabilities for the ultimate elimination of nuclear weapons. We develop nuclear capabilities to protect the hard work of the Chinese people and protect our people from the scourge of nuclear warfare. As to what stage China has reached in nuclear power, I wonder if you have watched the military parade in 2019. Let me be honest with you. The new nuclear arms shown on the military parade has been equipped to Chinese forces. But China has always pursued an appropriate path for developing nuclear capabilities. For protection of the country to prevent the scourge of nuclear war. China will keep the amount of its nuclear arsenal to that level. On China's national defense development, China grows its defense capabilities to ensure national security and ensure peace. The development of military of China is never intended to threaten others or seek hegemony. China is never a threat and has never threatened any others. China will not be the bully. And we are all clear-eyed who is the bully. China has never provoked a war and never invaded other countries. China pursues a path of peaceful development. China does not seek hegemony. That is written in the Constitution of the People's Republic of China and the Constitution of the Communist Party of China, reaffirming our commitment to peaceful development, and that's the purpose of China's national defense. On military cooperation with Russia, China and Russia are close neighbors, important partners. China-Russia relationship develops on the right and correct path. The growth of China-Russia relations is a partnership, not an alliance. It does not target any third party. Our relationship with Russia will continue to grow. That 
is what China will continue to do. You asked about whether China has provided material support to the Russian military. Let me make this clear. On the Ukraine crisis, China has never provided any material support to Russia. So these are some brief answers. There's、um, 44 people on my list. I don't think I will get through you all. So those five that I will call on,、uh, be crisp and brief. But、uh, here we go.、Um, just want to make sure, General, that since not everyone will ask the question in Mandarin, we're tactically prepared. Excellent.、Mm-hmm. Bich Tran from Vietnam.、Mm-hmm. Uh, thank you, Dr. Chipman, and thank you, General, for your remarks. So, I just want to have some clarification about your remarks earlier that China has never occupied even one inch of other country. So, but in the the history of 2,000 years, China has invaded Vietnam many times. So, I assume that your remarks applies only to the future. So is it China's promise that it will never occupy other country? Thank you. And from Japan,、uh, Tatsugoku Sato, Sai Shimbun.、Uh, thank you, General.、Uh, on your speech in 2019, Shangri-La Dialogue, you pledged that China understands and respects the sovereignty, independence, and territorial. Integrity of all countries. However, China has been continuing to keep silence from the U.S. General Assembly Board、uh, and refused to denounce Russia that violated Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Could you explain why? Thank you. And from India, Tanvi Madan. Uh, General, you spoke of regional peace and stability and the need to respect basic norms. How would you explain the PLA two years ago, almost to the day, unilaterally moving to change the status quo at multiple points、uh, at the line of actual control with India? Steps that led to a fatal military clash, the first in 45 years between the two countries, and steps that were in violation of agreements that Beijing and Delhi had carefully negotiated over 25 years. Thank you. And from、uh, and from the Republic of Korea, Chung Min Lee. Thank you,、uh, Minister. Intelligence reports assume that very soon North Korea will conduct its seventh nuclear test. What will China do to prevent Kim Jong Un from conducting another nuclear test and threatening the entire peace and stability of Northeast Asia? Thank you. And a parliamentarian from the European Union and Germany, Reinhard Butifoker. Th- thank you, Dr. Chipman. General Wei, China has claimed for decades that sovereignty and territorial integrity are core principles in international relations. In the case of Ukraine, China even entered into. A strategic partnership in 2013 on that basis. Why is China not honoring that? Why does China act as if the sovereignty of countries with a bigger neighbor had to come with a rebate? Why does not China tell Russia to stop an unprovoked illegal aggression? Thank you. And I can add a sixth, Dimitri Dimitri Sevastopolo from the UK. Oh, sorry.、Um, sorry, the yeah, Dimitri, go ahead.、Uh, thank you. Uh, to uh, avoid an international incident, it's actually Dimitri Sevastopolo from Ireland, but. I'm very sorry not to have got the protocol right. <laughs> uh, General, uh, thank you very much.、Um, you talked a lot about peaceful、uh, development and transparency, and China not going to be an aggressor. 
But last year, on July 27th, you tested a historic test of a hypersonic weapon that fired a missile as it flew over the Chao Sea near Taiwan. Can you explain what is the purpose of that weapon? Is it for a Taiwan conflict, or does it have broader applications? And why has China not admitted publicly that it actually conducted this test if it's so transparent about its military development? Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'll let General uh, Wei uh, note all those questions. Those are six plus five, eleven. So it's been a, a strong session. You have three minutes and thirty-one seconds, but I'll give you two minutes more. Please go ahead, General. <laughs> well, that's less than one minute for each question. So the answers have to be very brief. People are very interested in Russia and the Ukraine crisis. Let me say that on Ukraine, like the points I've made in the opening remarks, I want to emphasize that Does Russia, Ukraine, or Europe want such a war? Who really wants this war? The crisis will bring tremendous damage to both Ukraine, Russia, and Europe. And also, it affects China tremendously, also Singapore food and energy crisis. Yesterday, the Singaporean military officer told me that gas price is rising. Nobody wants to see a war like this, but why is there a war? What is the root cause? Who should be responsible? How can we facilitate peace talks, promote the end of the war? That is the direction that we must work hard toward. Providing weapons, imposing maximum pressure does not help solve the problem. The crisis is still escalating. The war is continuing. So these measures won't work. China's position is consistent. We believe it's important to facilitate peace talks to bring an end to the war and restore peace. On the status quo on China-India border areas, China and India are neighbors. Maintaining a good relationship meets the interests of both countries, and that is what we are working on. But on frictions along the border areas, the merits of the issue is clear. I personally experience the start and end of the frictions as defense minister. We have found a lot of weapons owned by the Indian side. They have also sent people to the Chinese side of the territory. But the Chinese has always been involved in the military force. Now I can tell you that the Chinese has always been involved in the military force. Now I can tell you that the Chinese has always been involved in the military force. Now I can tell you that the Chinese has always been involved in the military force. Now I can tell you that the Chinese has always been involved in the military force. Now I can tell you that the Chinese has always been involved in the military force. Now I can tell you that the Chinese has always been involved in the military force. Now I can tell you that the Chinese has always been involved we have 15 rounds of COP commander levels uh, uh, negotiations with India, and we are working together for peace in this area. And you also mentioned the DPRK. China also pays close attention on this, and China is does not want to see any war or instability on the Korean Peninsula, and we hope that. 
we can have peace, and we will continue to promote peace. But I think we should accommodate to the security concerns of all parties. Security on the Korean Peninsula cannot be solved with uh, maximum pressure. And in particular, for DPRK, we need to help them to solve their problems. I don't know whether you understand the conditions of uh, the DPRK. I traveled through the border between China and DPRK, and people in DPRK did not live a very good life. And living standards are not good because of all the international sanctions. Therefore, the concerns of the DPRK side is not addressed by the international community. Therefore, we need to sit down with each other with good faith to solve the problem. I also talked with uh, the ROK defense minister on the Korean Peninsula and uh, told him that uh, if there were instabilities here, I think the DPRK and ROK and China and neighboring countries will suffer first. As for the supersonic weapons, many countries are testing weapons, and I think there's no surprise that I, that China is uh, do, uh, doing so. China will develop its military. I think it's natural. As for is it targeted at anyone? These weapons are for protecting peace and protecting national interests of China. I think the development of military capabilities is reasonable. China has developed to today. I think it's natural for us to have some new weapons. And also the question on China's relationship with Vietnam. I suggest you read the history between China and Vietnam. And what the relationship is between China and Vietnam. The current relationship is very good. I'm a good brother and good friend with the minister of Vietnam. Therefore, as for what happened in the past? I think you need to read history. We have similar culture and languages. And then I think if you read history, you can have a better understanding. May I invite you to do two things. Uh, first, please stay in the room because the next plenary will start in two minutes and all three speakers are here, and I'll invite them in a moment to mount the stage. And the second thing to do, and most important to conclude this plenary, please thank General Wei for his speech and the answer to his questions. Oh, this year.